Does John 14 refer to the rapture? So get with me John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, what many people think about John 14 is they think that when the Lord comes to receive people to himself, they think that it is a description of the rapture. Now, I want you to think through this with me. Is it possible that John 14 is a reference to the rapture? The answer is that it's not. Get with me 1 Corinthians 15. I'll show you why it's not. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. Let's just look at this. Keep 1 Corinthians 15, but get 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians 2, and let's look at verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. So 1 Corinthians 2 defines what a mystery is. A mystery is hidden wisdom. In other words, a mystery is wisdom that has been hidden for a period of time. So we understand what a mystery is. It's hidden wisdom. So now back to 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. Well, that's hidden wisdom. Well, if it's hidden wisdom, that means it couldn't have been previously revealed. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of the... uh, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The body of Christ, the dispensation of grace, is itself a mystery. So let's look at the dispensational chart without the dispensation of grace. This is how the chart would have looked if you stood in Acts 8. And someone said to you, could you draw me a timetable of history? This is what it would look like because the dispensation of grace was not revealed. There was no information about the body of Christ. There was no information about the rapture because the rapture is an event that ends the dispensation of grace. Well, if there was no dispensation of grace, if there was no body of Christ that was revealed, then the rapture could not have been known. What that tells you is, whatever John 14 is writing about, it cannot possibly be the rapture, because the number of people on earth that knew about the rapture in John 14 was zero. Zip, zilch, nada. It just was not known because it was a mystery that would be revealed to the Apostle Paul. Now get with me Matthew 24. I want to show you some other verses in the Gospels that people think refer to the rapture. Matthew chapter 24. And Matthew 24, let's look at verse 40. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken, and the other left. And people look at that and they say, well, that's obviously the rapture, right? There's two people there, one of them is gone, poof, and uh, that's the rapture, right? The believer goes, they're taken, they disappear, and so on. Well, what have we learned from our studies? We always have to read the context. So look with me at verse 39. Matthew 24, verse 39. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, 
so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. When Matthew 24 talks about the coming of the Son of Man, what is it talking about? It's talking about the second coming. That's the event that's being described. So in Matthew 24, verses 40 and 41, what's being described there is the second coming. Look with me at verse 42. So we looked at verse 39, which was the verse right before the verses that are thought to be the rapture. Verse 42 is the verse right after. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. That's a reference to the second coming. Get Luke 17. Luke 17. This is another passage that people think refers to the rapture. It's, it's obviously in the Gospels, but people think it refers to the rapture. Luke 17, verse 34. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken, and the other left. Luke 17, just like Matthew chapter 24, just like John 14, is not a reference to the rapture. It's a reference to the second coming. We've talked previously about the key to understanding the scriptures is to find relevant cross-references. So as we think about what event this is, we need to find relevant cross-references. So get with me Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And in Matthew chapter 13, we're going to look at the parable of the wheat and the tares. So Matthew 13, verse 24. Matthew 13, 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. So there's both wheat and tares in the field. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy, thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So let's make sure we understand what that parable is telling us. What, what the Lord did there is he sowed good seed. He sowed wheat. But an enemy came and sowed tares. And so when it came for the crops to pop up, there was both wheat and tares present. So the question was put to the Lord, should we go get rid of the weeds? Do you want us to go rip out the tares? And the Lord said, no, don't do that because they're, they're growing together and you might rip out some of the good seed. So what you do is just wait, just let it grow to maturity. And then what it says in verse 30 is let them grow together until the harvest. Now notice the rest of verse 30. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares. So between the tares and the wheat, which is gathered first? The tares are. Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So first they pulled out the tares to be burned, and then they gathered the wheat. Look with me at verse 36. The Lord is going to give the specific interpretation of this parable. So look at verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, 
declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. So they're saying, we heard, this, we heard what you, the parable, but yeah, we honestly don't get it. So tell us what it means. Verse 37, he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. That's obviously Jesus Christ. Verse 38, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Okay, the good seed are the children of the kingdom. Those are believers. The tares are the children of the wicked one. Those are lost. Verse 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are angels. So when it describes here the end of the world, I believe it's talking about uh, the, uh, what happens at the end of the 70th week. Now, notice this. Let's read verse 39 once more. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. So it's the Lord's angels that go out and reap. That, In other words, first they reap the tares, the bad seed, then they gather the good seed. Verse 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. Now we've said this a couple times, which is gathered first, the tares or the wheat? Well, it's the tares. And the tares are gathered to be burned. When the, when the children of the wicked are gathered to be burned, what's that a description of? It's a description of hell, obviously. Look at verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. And we just saw two verses ago that the angels are reapers. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, I want you to think about that for me, with me just for a minute. Here's what happens at the second coming. What Jesus Christ does at the second coming is he returns in wrath and takes vengeance on his adversaries. If you read Revelation, the judgment that occurs causes blood to flow at the level of a horse's bridle for 200 miles. Think about the slaughter that must happen for blood to flow for 200 miles at the level of a horse's bridle is just shocking, right? What the Lord does at the second coming is he destroys his adversaries. When he sets up his kingdom, how many rebels do you think he wants in the kingdom? And the answer is none. So what he does is he sends out his angels as reapers to gather the tares. Now, I know I spent a lot of time on the parable of the tares, but I want you to think with me for a minute. When we were in Matthew 24, and I'll just read this to you for the sake of time. Matthew 24. Verse 40. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. People nowadays read that and they say, well, that's the rapture. The one that's taken is they're taken to heaven to be with the Lord. No, that's not what it is at all. That verse is about the second coming. The one that is taken, the one that is first taken, where are they taken? They're taken to be destroyed in the fire of hell. Matthew 24 verse 40 is not a verse about Oh, joy, the rapture is going to happen and we're going to be taken to glory. Matthew 24, verse 40 is where the Lord Jesus Christ returns. He's going to set up his kingdom. But before he does that, he sends out his angels as reapers and they are to gather out of his kingdom all things that offend. So Matthew 24 is not the rapture. Luke 17 is not the rapture. John 14 is is not the rapture. Now in John 14, I, I want to spend just a little bit of time here to show you something about um, just some interesting facts about, about 
the Lord's about what the Lord is preparing for folks under the kingdom program. So look at me at John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. So what the Lord says there is that there's many mansions in the Father's house. Now, when he says that, what mansion is he talking about? People sometimes think, well, that mansion is uh, it's a reference to the new heavens, and it's a reference to where people are going to be in, in heaven. But you know that can't be right, because during the Lord's earthly ministry, who is he speaking to? He's speaking to Israel. And, and what is Israel going to inherit? Well, they're going to inherit the new earth. And so it seems obvious, if you think about this, that when John 14 refers to the Father's house— it must be referring to, drum roll, the New Jerusalem. Give me Revelation 21. Revelation 21. We do have a studio audience. We do not have an orchestra. So what happens is I have to do all the sound effects myself. Understand, we are a very efficient economical operation. I told you just yesterday that we brought on our first corporate sponsor. Um, the studio audience is really misbehaving right now. If you were to be able to see this, you would be so very utterly disappointed with the studio audience's behavior. So uh, be thankful you're watching remotely. Uh, John chapter 21, John cha or Revelation 21, I'm sorry, Revelation 21. I got distracted by the things going on here. Revelation 21, verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Do you remember how John 14 talked about the Lord went to prepare a place for them? Well, it's the new Jerusalem that's going to return to earth, which is where they're going to live. Now look at me at verse 15. And he that talked with me had a golden reed, good word, to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. Uh, reed is misspelled there, actually. But verse 16, and the city lieth foursquare, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, good word, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. Now, pause here just for a minute. So we're told something about the length of the city, and it is 12,000 furlongs. So how long is a furlong? Well, a furlong is an eighth of a mile. So 12,000 furlongs is 1,500 miles. Now, when we're told about the city, the city is a cube, right? So it's, its length is 1,500 miles, and its width is 1,500 miles, and its height is 1,500 miles. Now, just to give you an idea, this is a massive, massive city. So if you take 1,500 miles length and 1,500 miles width, and so you just determine the square footage of that, you multiply them, what you end up with is 2.25 million square miles. 1,500 miles times 1,500 miles, you get 2.25 million square miles. How big do you think the United States is? The United States is only 3.797 million square miles. In other words, imagine a city where its footprint is over 59% of the size of the United States. Do you realize how big a city that is? Let me put it this way. If you think of the biggest cities that exist in the United States, they occupy just a trivial fraction of that, right? Drive through New York. As you drive through New York, you realize that in that state, most of that state is not city. Well, imagine a city that is larger than 59% of the United States as a single city. But then think about this with me, if you would. It's then 1,500 miles high. 
So its cubic dimension is just absolutely, utterly massive. Now, I did this just for fun, um, but what is the tallest structure in the world right now, the tallest building? The answer to that is that the Jeddah Tower in Saudi Arabia is projected to be completed in 2020. When it's completed, it will be 1,008 meters high. In other words, 0.62 of a mile. So the tallest thing on earth is gonna be 0.62 miles. In other words, less than a mile. The New Jerusalem is gonna be 1,500 miles tall. Can you imagine how absolutely, utterly massive the New Jerusalem must be? Now, I, I, I did a little math here. Maybe you can tell I like math, but what is the largest house on the earth today? Have you ever wondered that? The largest house on earth today is there's a house in Mumbai, India, and it has a 49,000 square foot base, not miles, square feet. So 49,000 square foot base. And it has, I believe, 27 or 28 floors. It's 550 square feet high. So, or it's 550 feet in height. So in other words, its footprint, in terms of square footage, is 49,000 square feet. Its height is 550 feet. So if we multiply those together, we get the cubic dimension of the largest house in the world. So if we do that, I did the math for you here, the largest house in the world is 0 0.00018 cubic miles. 0 0.00018 cubic miles. So now you ready? Here's what this means. The New Jerusalem can hold 12.5 billion of the largest house on earth today. That means you might not be cramped for space. What that, and by the way, you're not gonna be there because you live during the dispensation of grace. But when the Lord said that he went to prepare mansions for people, the new Jerusalem is so absolutely, utterly vast that it can hold 12.5 billion of the world's largest home. Praise the Lord. So the folks under the kingdom program have, uh, they have a blessed future to look forward to. They've got some good digs.